to the Festival of the Future City, part of, part of the Bristol Festival of Ideas. We're here today to talk about building integrated and inclusive cities. And um, we've assembled a rather wonderful all-female panel, which just goes to show that there is expertise all over the place. Isn't that an astonishing concept? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think what we're going to do is <clears throat> each of these fantastically knowledgeable, practical, experienced people will talk for six or seven minutes about what they've been doing and their view on how we build the cities of the future. I'll ask them a couple of questions or clarifications, and then we'll turn to you to ask you what you would like to know more of, what you disagree with, what you think we've left out, mm -hmm. and hope to get a proper conversation going. Oh, I always like at these sessions to leave you know, a lot of time for questions and discussion instead of you know, the statutory five minutes at the end, because this is about all of us, and it also is about inclusion, so it'd be a bit rude not to include you. So what I'd like to do first of all is um, turn to Farah Elahi, who's on my left, on your right, who's in charge of research and policy at the Runnymede Trust. So Farah, over to you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm in charge. I'm a researcher there. So um, the Runnymede Trust is a race equality think tank, and we do research on racial inequality in the UK. Um, in particular, a lot of my research has focused on London and the ethnic inequality within London across different boroughs, working very closely with the grassroots communities and local authorities and kind of public sector organisations to think about equality. Um, when I was trying to think about building integrated and inclusive cities, um, I thought the first thing, and as I'm going first, I'll, I'll try and set out what this might mean, um, that we have to have a really clear idea of what these two terms mean. So when we say integrated, who's integrated and into what are they integrated? And then similarly, when we say inclusive, who's being included and in what are they being included? Um, what are the systems and processes that we need in order to make these integrated and inclusive cities a reality, which I think is what we're trying to answer today. Um, when we look at any sector or arena, they have built into them what it means to be successful. And by looking at who succeeds, at, we can start to get a sense of how integrated and inclusive our cities are. When we ask people how they feel about their ability to succeed or flourish in a city, we get a sense of how integrated and inclusive our cities are. So as um, a data researcher, I thought I'd bring some data um, relevant to Bristol. So how integrated is Bristol? In the last census, the Runnymede Trust did um, some research with the University of Manchester to try and map um, ethnic inequality across all the um, 348 districts in England and Wales. Bristol came seventh, <coughs> or the seventh most unequal city um, out of 348. So that was obviously 2011 data. You know, some people might say, oh, it's seven years out, although I don't think the pictures changed that much. I brought some more recent data. The 2015 Index of Multiple Deprivation found that um, Bristol has many deprivation hotspots. Some of the most deprived areas in England sit side by side with some of the wealthiest areas. 16% of residents, so that's 69,000 people in Bristol, live in the 10% most deprived areas in England. And if you compare that to the 2010 Index of Multiple Deprivation, um, the proportion of people living in the most deprived areas has increased, so it's becoming more acute. Um, when we look at particular sectors, so in education, there's kind of significant inequality, in particular for black Caribbean, Somali and Pakistani young people. Um, and the <coughs> inequality in Bristol is more acute than it is for each cohort nationally. So there's, these patterns are kind of national, but it's actually, it's, in terms of education, it's worse in Bristol. Um, when we look at housing, 71% of white British living in the southwest um, own their own home. That's compared to 38% of all other ethnic groups. So that's a difference of 33 percentage points. And that's the largest gap across all regions in England. So the difference between your home ownership rate, if you're from an ethnic minority background or if you're from a white British background, is most significant in this region in the southwest. 
And everyone thinks of housing inequality when they think of London, but actually the gap between the ethnic minorities and the white British community is smaller there at 26 percentage points. So um, that's housing. If you look at homelessness, you're four times more likely to be homeless if you come from a black household than if you come from a white household. I could go on. There's a lot of statistics. There's a lot of data. But I think we have a sense that actually across different indicators, across different sectors, if you come from an ethnic minority background or if you come from a um, uh, disadvantaged background, whether you're looking at class, whether you're looking at disadvantage as a result of gender, your outcomes are not equal to, um, uh, let's say, if you're looking at race, if you're from BME compared to white British, if you're looking at gender, women compared to men, if you're looking at class, working class compared to uh, middle or wealthier classes. But what does this data mean in terms of integration and inclusion? I think what it really <coughs> indicates is that we shouldn't just have a samosa, saris, and steel ban version of integration and inclusion. Um, we have to have an understanding of the structures and how they operate for different groups in our society. Now, I want to just preempt um, the kind of standard response we often get as equality activists or equality researchers when we have these discussions, which is, what about meritocracy? Um, we always get this answer that, you know, I really want to feel that I'm the best person for the job and that's why I'm getting it and that's why we need to, you know, uh, not really worry about these statistics. And whilst I, I support the idea of fairness, the reason why I'm going through the statistics is to highlight that that's not the society that we currently live in. We don't live in a meritocratic society. You don't get the job if you're the best person for it. Your race, class, gender, religion, disability, sexual orientation all still impact your life outcomes to varying degrees. Your, at the moment, your ability to succeed is based on your ability to perform what success looks like in a very particular way. And that brings me full circle back to the principle I started with, which is that all structures are designed to recognize success in coded ways. The problem is not that the people succeeding are not talented or worthy. That's not the issue. But we need to rec recognize that they're succeeding within a system that is built to recognize their success. I heard an analogy recently on a podcast, which is that Cinderella's foot fit into the slipper because it was made for her. Her foot did not do anything in particular to kind of adapt to, to do that. And when we're thinking about processes, when we're thinking of our institutions and our structures, we shouldn't just think that um, if there's diversity around the table, then that is an inclusive or an integrated space. But we need to recognize that if that diversity still has to perform in a, in a kind of normative way and is not allowed to express itself, it's not diversity. So if, for example, if we think of schools, if you're... you're um, if you have like an afro and that's considered uh, messy um, and you have to um, make it behave in the way <coughs> white hair behaves, that's not inclusive, that's not a, a line representation. I mean, that's a very shallow example, but just the first one that came to mind. Um, and what we need to recognize is that in any sector, there's kind of the mainstream, the center, and then there's the fringe or those who organize within grassroots. And the reality is that the fringe and those grassroots organizations are already operating in radical ways. They have, they're using participatory democracy, they're using inclusive practices and representing different voices um, within the way in which they're doing them. They're doing things in innovative, interesting ways. And success is not just getting the people who are at the fringe to get jobs in the center or to look like the center. It's about getting the center to shift so that it's starting to look like the fringe. So we need to overturn the processes at the center and step away from just tick box exercises and really engage deeply with representation. So the challenge going forward is how can we interrogate the structures in our own cities or in our own, whether it's our own workplace or in our, even our own friend circles um, so that they're inclusive in the truest sense. Brilliant. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> that a wonderful kind of setting out of what it looks like, um, you know, as a sort of background against which we can now start to explore some of the details. So that was great. 
So Ellie. Hello. Ellie Cosgrove is lecturer in urban innovation at UCL City Leadership Lab. She's worked on low carbon cities. She's worked on cities that are safe for women. And she is now uh, chair of My Body Back, I understand. Yes, I'll explain a bit more. I just want okay. to thank you to start off with. I mean, I'm just super excited to be here and to hopefully I'll build on some of the things you're gonna, that you said. Um, yes, I am an engineer by training, um, but I'm also a human. So I have, no. um, I know, <laughs> not, <laughs> it's, not a, it's not something a lot of engineers um, show to the world, but I think it's really important actually that as <coughs> professions we, we do show that actually we, we have personalities and opinions and politics where engineering generally tries to say, I'm apolitical, I'm just optimizing it, it doesn't make any, any difference. So yes, human engineer in front of you. And, um, and the human part of me is also so, uh, a, a human that cares deeply about uh, inclusion, about safety and about human rights and about an equal distribution of those rights. And again, similar to you, Farah, when I was preparing for this, I wanted to, s to deconstruct, okay, so what do we mean by this? Uh, inclusive city and my my view uh, is an, an inclusive city is one where civil liberties civil liberties and human rights are protected equally for everyone and um, I would like to just dig in again to some of those so those words I'd like to define what a right is and I'd like to define what everyone is I would like to also define what equally is but I've got five minutes <laughs> so I think that's one. Equal is something slightly more understood, I think. But what does rights mean in terms of a city? How do we interpret that in our places? Um, and David Harvey has, um, <coughs> a, a, has commented many times on this. His, his, his work is about this. Um, he says, the right to the city is far more than individual liberty to access urban resources. It is a right to change ourselves by engaging with the city. And this is beautiful because it shows that this isn't just about having access to housing, having access to energy, <coughs> education, work that the city offers. This is deeply personal and it's deeply about our rights to thrive in the world. Moreover, he argues it is a common rather than individual right. Since this transformation inevitably depends on the exercise of a collective power to reshape the process of urbanization. <coughs> so it's it should be all of our, within all of our rights, within all of our power to reshape the place that we live in together. And it's really important when we come back to the idea of who is everyone, that we understand that everyone includes multiple identities and that it, if we do not, or, and that we must be explicit about naming those multiple identities because if we are not explicit about it, we design for, white, cis, middle class, um, male. And once we can start with those definitions, we can start to deconstruct them, we can start to understand what they mean for our practice. Now, this is still staying quite theoretical, quite high level. I would like to bring it down into what that actually means in practice in the city. And for me, a good focus focal point is looking at urban transport, trans how we move around the city as a fundamental right uh, to movement. And so just to illustrate the point of, of the common uh, rights, uh, I'd like to look at women's experience on transport and particularly two things. One, harassment in public spaces. We know that harassment, <laughs> for example, in London uh, one in seven women every year can expect to be to receive unwanted sexual attention. We know that the statistics around violence in public spaces um, is is immense. And I've been working on a project this week where we, TFL has given us a bus to play with. And what we want to do in that bus is to showcase how bystanders, how how we as this collective force, can can make a change together. I can talk a bit little bit more about that later if that's of interest. Um, but for my day job, talking about engineering, design and transport, the way, as I said before, engineers think about master planning tr transport systems is 
the assumption that sits within it is let's get as many people into the city in the morning as possible and as many people out at night uh, in the evening. Now, that seems kind of logical because that's kind of what we need to do, right? Access the economy, blah, blah, blah. Right. What we do not understand as engineers when we're designing those systems is for whom you're designing, um, for, what, for what purpose, and what kind of impact does that have on those people. And we don't have a language or process to talk about or deconstruct that. For example, if we optimize that, then generally you're talking about optimizing the system for, for people who want to access the paid labor market. We know that's disproportionately middle class white people uh, and men, and that actually it, uh, a lot of female roles revolve around local activities, uh, um, around caring responsibilities. Often you have multi-stop journeys, you're maybe going to pick up the kids, going to the shops, going to care for someone. You're um, likely to be encumbered, maybe with a pram. If you're disabled, you're likely to have different issues. We don't currently optimize for those systems, for those, those type, you, you know, getting five minutes down the road in London can be more tricky than getting straight into central London. So I'm not say, So we, we as engineers need to be able to deconstruct those social and economic issues and feed and be able to interpret them into our designs. I'll put that out there and I'm going to wrap up. Um, so in summary, I think firstly we need to think about the city in terms of rights we've got to consider to whom those rights belong, who, whose rights, if we're going to elevate the collective right, do, needs to be reduced, the re reducing the right to harass, which currently exists in public space, if not legally. Um, and we need to activate our collective power, and we need to codify this knowledge into our professional system. Great. Yeah? Long expected an engineer, very clear. <laughs> okay, next up uh, is Imi Kaur, who is co founder of the Impact Hub in Birmingham. The Impact Hub is a network of citizens and activists and artists and makers and do doers, and like Imi, they do amazing things. So, Imi, what does it look like from Birmingham? <coughs> Well, thank you, Margaret. It's uh, hi everyone. Um, it's a bit <coughs> nerve-wracking going after these two. So, if I've said some stuff that they've already said, we didn't know each other before. We've all just coalesced in these uh, five minutes. So it mm. means we should be on a good track or, or completely in the wrong place. Um, <laughs> so you guys can decide that. Um, in one of my voluntary hats, I'm um, I'm a curator of uh, TEDx Brum, and I have a over the years I've I've learned a, a pretty simple rule about. Um, how to start building the, the foundations of a, of a more dynamic and inclusive uh, team. And, and one of the, the rules I have is that when I put um, people on the stage for TEDx, so I curate maybe like 25 speakers a year, um, that I absolutely, nine times out of 10 or 90% of the time, will uh, not have uh, marginalised people, people of colour, people from the trans or the LGBT community, um, talking on the stage about race or gender or oppression or inequality or Black History Month um, or, you know, many other things that we're taught to kind of uh, hear from from, uh, from communities that are uh, seen as the fringe or diverse, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, and the, the obvious reason, if you haven't picked up, is because Many people are much more than that. It's a one very important named part of their identity, but they're also artists and scientists and activists and discovering incredible things. And as a starting point, I always like to build my teams and my speaker lists and my uh, festivals in that way um, to, to give that real kind of dynamic and inclusive uh, foundation. But today, I'm going to break all those rules because I'm going to talk about those things. Uh, and I'm going to implicitly talk about those things because uh, there's a few things that I've seen in my practice over the last sort of five or six years being involved in some incredible things and that really tells me that we need to go back to some very, very clear basics when we're understanding the language of inclusive and in integrated and um, the way we need to build our cities in the future. Um, if I was not breaking my rules, I'd talk to you about how the Impact Hub has been working on citizen-led innovation around childcare and housing and the role of artists in cities and what more widely my colleagues at Zero Zero are looking at the same stuff in architecture, 
in open making, how we democratise the ability for citizens to be part of making their cities. As was mentioned at the beginning, that is a fundamental right and sign of a, of a of an engaged and empowered, inclusive city where citizens are able to make the places around them. Um, but I am going to break the rules because I think that what I've seen over the last, my own rules, is what I've seen over the last year or two is that we are struggling at the moment to even get the basics right. And some of the data has been uh, talked talked about and some of the particular examples around stats around sexual harassment, etc. Have been, have been talked about. But in the, in the last few years, inclusive growth as a term has become the sort of darling buzzword of economics uh, where we have everybody from consultants in the in the social space to activists to politicians using the term inclusive growth um, as something that we all need to do we all need to grow together um, and we need to make sure we leave nobody behind um, and I've seen a lot of work in the inclusive growth space happen um, and largely happen with the same types of people. So we have had very white middle class, um, with no offence to think tanks because they do great work, but think tank led approaches to, to the idea of inclusive growth. When we had a blank canvas for a, a radical, bold, open discussion of what about a new economy could look like. And so what that meant is that that was then, as always, as the term social enterprise and as other terms we've seen over the last decade or so, was quickly co-opted by the po politicians. Uh, so regularly you hear inclusive growth being used in my city. So if you talk about the, the view from Birmingham, we've got a slightly different um, context in, in where we are at with a new metro mayor, etc. But we have these conversations um, regularly had in Birmingham around inclusive growth. So you will hear on, a, on a large stages in Birmingham, we're the rapidly, most rapidly growing economy in the UK. We have more inward investment than um, uh, anywhere else in Europe, apparently, currently. We are attracting investors at a rate of, of knots, and it's Birmingham's time. Um, and then you'll hear a little addendum where it's like, and we need to make sure we leave nobody behind. We need to make sure this growth is inclusive. And the current ways that we're thinking about this sort of stuff is um, we have large foreign investors coming into Birmingham who are creating jobs, quite bad jobs, that people will get. And so they'll have some wages and the profits made from that will go back to the same old shareholder uh, return in, in this case, in foreign country. And our politicians are using the terms inclusive growth, and adding them on and finding the bits that suit them because it's like the next new buzzword. And so I've regularly <coughs> been challenging this and asking everywhere I possibly can with a good friend of mine, Claire Devaney, who did a talk at TEDx on Sunday, so it'll be released soon, I suggest you watch it. He's also been doing some work on, um, on inclusive growth. We've been challenging people to say, so what is it that you actually mean by inclusive growth? And you find that when you challenge that a little bit more, we have no real idea. We're not talking about democracy of ownership. We're not talking about citizens' ability to participate and create and build their cities. We're not talking about the way land is owned. We're not talking about how citizens can be involved in the housing crisis. We're not talking about any of, any of these things when we talk about inclusive growth in my city. But this isn't just a Birm from a, a situation that's occurring in Birmingham. I think this is because we started yet another conversation about a new future that we saw with the same foundations that we've created everything else. So an example um, around some of this is that um, when we have been, when you look at the majority makeup of the types of commissions and reports and um, looks into this idea of inclusivity and in integration bar some, some brilliant examples like the Running Meat Trust. Um, we're building it from the same place. We're building it from this idea that we can go out and consult citizens and we'll find out some stuff from people that are not like us and we'll write it into the report. And in the meantime, we've made a kind of a whole consultancy career for people working in inclusive growth or like it was social enterprise before that or whatever the new buzz term that was going to solve all our social problems were before that. 
And so the couple of things that I just really want to add to this conversation is around really interrogating what we mean by these terms. The institutional structures, the meanings, the way in which we are building the teams um, and the, the, the people who are leading on this type of work. So another term that, we're, again, that um, um, Farah looked into that I just want to build from is this term of integration. Like, what are we integrating <coughs> into? What is this centre point that is the one that everybody else is diverse from? And if it is that the centre point is white and anyone who's not white is diverse, then let's name that. Let's not just pretend that diversity is like anyone who doesn't look like me, but, but, but we're not saying that white is the centre, we're just saying that that's... Di let's be really implicit about what we mean by these things, because if that is what we mean, then we can work from there, right? But while we're being really fluid about what we mean, we have no place to understand when someone mentions something, what we're talking about. And the second thing I'd argue <coughs> around the term of integration is I'm not entirely sure or convinced that we have a bold, uh, bright, not even radical, but confident position about what um, our British values are right now and what we want to be in the world. Therefore, I would argue that when we're asking people to integrate into something, we need to be really clear about what that integration and that future is so that we know what we're actually doing. Because if we're not sure about that, then maybe we can start to come together and look at what alternative futures around that look like. And maybe, like the past, when we, when we and I am British, colonised half the world and learnt a lot from other cultures, maybe it's a time to look at what we have in this country and look at is there new models and new ways, like Farah mentioned on the fringe, that are actually doing things in a more fluid, participatory way that could be the future. It's just a question, it's not the answer. So the final thing I just want to say before I wrap up, is that um, a recent example um, highlights what happens when you're designing things with not lots of people in the room. So some of you might have remembered when the Uber um, London shutting down the Uber licence conversation happened. There was uh, some really interesting things happening in the days on Twitter when that happened. So it certainly wasn't one of those things where there were two viewpoints or one viewpoint and most of us agreed all that you know liberals are on one side the sort of conservatives were on the other side this did not happen and i found it fascinating because the techies were going crazy about the fact that london is closed and we're not open to radical disruptive technology and this is really terrible and those who were on the good tech tech for good side were saying tech disruptive tech does not have to be uh, uh, unequal and and uh, creating harassment and creating all these things. Um, so it's okay that we are being bold and we're naming that we don't want companies like that in our city. Somewhere in the middle of that is an answer about how we create ethical disruptive tech. But if you looked a little bit deeper, the usual people that you would expect to be on the good for tech side, so a lot of my liberal, uh, largely people of color on my Twitter timeline and Facebook, were having another conversation. And this conversation fascinated me and led me down a whole uh, route of exp exploration. Mm -hmm. So women of colour were talking about how despite the fact that they knew that Uber was ethically uh, questionable, they'd never felt so safe travelling because Uber allowed you that safety. Trans people, so there's a whole other hashtag around this, were talking of even more layers of this. Uh, about how trans people, uh, many trans people in this conversation saying, I, I wouldn't even leave my house uh, if it wasn't for things like Uber, if it wasn't for the safety of that, because public transport and commuting um, as, a, as a trans person is really dangerous uh, for me. So as an example, when you have more people talking around the same issue, you and this is a really, really simple example, you can start to get insights that you never, ever expected. And I would say that we really need to wipe the slate clean with what we mean about um, this, this inclusive future and actually get some more people in the conversation and we need to be more radical and more bold about what this looks like. Uh, we need to figure out what we don't know about what we don't know. It need, we need to get there, yet we're nowhere close to it. And I don't think that it's okay that we keep using excuses in 2017, any of us, that we are not making space, recognising our own privilege and power, moving out the way and bringing people who are different to us and talented into positions of power and influence and not just being consulted.
fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. And last but definitely not least, Charlotte Aldrich, uh, who until a few days ago was at the RSA and who's now setting up a new think tank called the Center for Progressive Policy. And if you want to know what that's going to do, you're going to have to wait a little while. In the meantime, Charlotte, what's on your mind when it comes to integration and inclusivity? Thank you, Robert, and thank you um, to your speakers. Um, so I've been thinking about inclusive growth, that devilish term that Imi talked about for a few years now. Um, I'm also white. I'm probably classed as middle class now, although I don't come from a middle class background. Um, I work in one of those terrible think tanks, where I used to, and now I'm setting another, another terrible think tank up. Um, and I also led two of those terrible commissions that go around consulting people. So I'm probably <coughs> not the most popular person on the panel. Um, but we love you anyway. Thanks. We do love you. <laughs> um, but um, I want to talk a little bit more about this definition of inclusive growth. I want to think about how we might or whether we might move to some kind of consensus around what it is that we need and whether or not we can still make progress um, if we are kind of uh, a little bit more ambiguous or still kind of um, figuring out some of the finer details. Um, I am then going to talk about um, how we might think about making change at a city level. Um, and then I think I'd really like to um, kind of pull apart some of the ideas that Imi was saying with regards to Birmingham's approach, although this is by no means, it won't be an, an attack on Birmingham because there are other city leaders um, who um, sort of might be missing the mark slightly when it comes to the extent of the vision that could be around something um, as bold as reimagining our economy. So I sort of say that there are two ways to think and talk about inclusive growth. The first um, is sort of around the hard economics of it. So we talk about um, comparative productivity rates um, at a regional level, and we can see that London and the South East skew our national productivity um, so that they are the only ones, or London in particular, is the only one that sits above the national average. Um, we also talk about Gini coefficients at a um, national level, trying to get a handle on the degree of um, distribution or in in inequalities that sit within nations. But we know that within cities, as others have mentioned, huge um, uh, disparities that sit um, within you know, very close geographical areas. Um, yesterday I was listening to um, the councillor who has lead responsibility for <coughs> learning and skills in Bristol. And I understand that in some areas, as low as 5% of young people go to university, and in others, it's just 85%. So there are huge challenges, but how the way in which we are able to measure those, the economic data statistician um, data collectors haven't, haven't caught up, and um, that's something I can talk a little bit about later. But these are these kind of hard economics that you can put on a graph, you can put on a chart, you can classify as an index of multiple deprivation. That's one thing. But there is another aspect that I think is equally more equally Im important, and potentially if not more so, and we've seen that um, in particular um, with the changing nature of our politics, arguably the Brexit vote, and that is something that's far more intangible. And it's about identity, belonging, and connectedness. It's potentially about the decline of um, traditional community or community institutions. It's about a shaking of a sense of self, of self-worth, um, of, of sense of agency, and a decline of hope, arguably. And so others have talked about you know, the definition of, about, of integratedness or integration. But I think a key question for me at a city level is the question, do I feel a part of this place? And um, from an economic growth perspective, do I feel like this place is going somewhere and I'm going with it? So those two ways about talking about inclusive growth mean that already we are opening it up into a potentially quite a nebulous concept. It spans and goes beyond the economic and reaches into territory of sociology, sometimes political philosophy and, 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 and many um, disciplines in between. Do we need to find intellectual consensus? 
is there an intercultural consensus emerging either within the UK or globally? Um, I would say no to that. The RSA definition that we were working with and others have, have, have been using is to think about inclusive growth as a means to enable as many people as possible to contribute to and benefit from a new kind of economic growth. And I think this is really important point to stress. The vision of inclusive growth, and again, other people call it different things, economic justice, social justice, a number of others. But for me, language is important, but in a way, it's, I think it's about redefining the model and stripping away the structural barriers that enable, um, or that inhibit rather, this shared prosperity, this ac access to opportunity, whether it's along social lines, so different particular groups, women, disabled people, BME, whatever it might be, or along spatial lines, and then thinking about the different geographies, again, whether that's local, regional, national, international. It's about breaking down those barriers, and it's about shifting away from a grow now, redistribute later approach to inclusivity or to equality, to, to a fairer society, and to thinking about how we integrate some of these hard economic and sort of more intangible ideas that can often be um, uh, shaped and aided by what we can would call <coughs> social policy. And I think we've seen, particularly, you know, I'm also one of those terrible people that used to w work in Whitehall, so I'm really, I'm not doing well today. But in Whitehall, there is this culture that pervades that what constitutes good economic policy is actually very different to what constitutes good social policy. And that makes no sense. So you'll have po policy and, and or in the old days and the, the kind of uh, remnants of this still pervade, targets that are based around increasing gross value added. So what does that mean? That means you take an approach, like Amy was referring to in Birmingham, that says you attract shiny the building of shiny new um, office blocks, grade A offices. You attract foreign investors. You bid, like it's currently going on in the US, for <coughs> Amazon's new headquarters. And you hope, at best, that somehow that is going to help. That is going to trickle down <coughs> to enable as many people as possible to participate in that wealth, that on the one hand, looks like what economists call an uptick in GDP. But what, given that, you know, in 2016, we were the fastest growing G7 economy, but at the same time, the vast majority of people were asking, where did I see any benefit from that? We really need to challenge this underlying uh, legitimacy that goes with so much of economic policy. And we need to think about how the investment in social infrastructure and our communities and the more intangible aspects that, that are um, as underpinning to our economic prosperity as any of those other things that I've mentioned, transport infrastructure, competition policy, whatever it might be. It is absolutely integral. So I think this is, the inclusive growth has the, has the potential to be a real radical shift away from our, our current economic grow now, redistribute later model, which is at the mercy of a political ideology determining how much to cream off from that national income and then invest in tackling inequalities through public services and welfare. The question is, how do we get there? And I think leaders across advanced e economies um, I in the globe, whether you know in, in, in central, western, eastern Europe, the US, and elsewhere, we're grappling with this challenge because people on the ground, citizens, are, are, are voters are asking, you know, it's not are saying it's not good enough and we, we need to see a change. How do we get there? Well, the commission that I headed up was designed to bring up the, this, the need for change, to raise the debate, and to think about how pragmatically we could try and start to shift thinking. It was unashamedly about navigating the politics of today, 
which might be called, you know, navigating the art of the immediately possible. It was what we could we get through that was as politically palatable, given the nature of our politics, but, in, but was really starting to alert people that, that a new approach could be found and it was going to take a, a radical shift to get there. But maybe if they could just start with some aspects that they feel comfortable, they'll kind of clock on and, uh, and we, could, we could go from there. Happily, we have seen leaders take note of this. Um, and, we, and I'm having conversations at a G, G7 and a G20 level, as well as cities across the world. It's also being wrapped up into threats to globalization, open trade. It's being caught up with a, uh, questions around how, whether, and, we, and what the alternative is in moving away from a neoliberalist, capitalist, um, global economic system. But there are some really profound questions and challenges in thinking about what aspects of those existing systems do we retain? Do we adapt? Do we abolish? if we are to create an economy that truly works for everyone. Now, I've been called a neoliberal apologist and a communist within, you know, as many days. So again, I'm not that popular, I think, is the overarching <laughs> I've figured out today. And I, but I think what that goes to show is that we are treading a fine line. The vision is radical, but the ability to get there is immensely difficult. And it, it means absolutely right that kind of shallow consultation is not going to be the way forward. We need to make it real. Now, I'm probably running out of time, so I just want to, um, to leave you with three questions that I think, at a local level, we could, what we can do is, regardless of all those kind of existential debates, the kind of global political, global political economy um, discussions that, that, that may or may not be taking place, what can be happening on the ground? The first question that we should be asking is, what kind of city do we want to create? What are the values that we want to live by? What are the terms of trade we want business and investors to operate with and for our communities? What are the key barriers to inclusive growth in our place? What does the data say? But what do people say? People, residents, businesses, um, large and small, um, community organisations, representative um, uh, bodies and uh, associations. What is the intelligence on the ground telling you about the key barriers? And what are they also telling you about opportunities you might not have thought about in overcoming them? And that leads me on to the final thing. Do you have the institutional architecture that enables you, that you know, the systems processes that we heard earlier, to really start to break down those barriers and to, to design together a, a system that is collaborative, that brings together the collective resource across the city and the wider region in order to, um, in order to, to fulfill that, that shared vision, that shared sense of mission for the kind of place that you want to create. And despite the statistics of Bristol with its entrenched and increasing inequality, one of the things that I'm always privileged and proud to, um, to talk about here but elsewhere is this new Bristol City office which I think is just the kind of institutional structure that bridges, um, that starts to bridge divide within and, and um, across the city and the city region, that brings people together, that says we want to be part of something um, regardless of the, the, the perspective or the ideological or the institutional organisational silos from which we inevitably, arguably, come from. How can we start to bring our, our, our collective resource together to fulfill a mission that we can all, every single one of us, get behind. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, a range of perspectives. Um, Farah, I was interested, you know, that you did bring us a lot of the data that Charlotte was saying that we need, um, and seemed also to be uncomfortable with whether we have the framework, the system and processes. But I'm also struck that we may get stuck in a kind of chicken and egg thing here, which is we don't have the system and processes with which to design the systems and processes with which to define what the heck it is we want to do with which to design then how we do those things that we still haven't decided yet how we're going to define. So where do we start? So I think it depends on what you mean by we. Um, I think there are people who have 
um, you know, people like Imi in Birmingham with the Impact Hub and, you know, so many different organizations across the country um, and, you know, really at grassroots level who have innovated and have thought of systems that are much better at least than what yeah. we have. Um, so there, and I think it's about learning from those and kind of building them into the mainstream structures. You know, we have a lot of the data, and actually I think the UK is probably one of the best countries in the world in terms of collecting data. <laughs> the problem is no one does anything <coughs> with it. So, you know, it's also about thinking, that's just kind of a yardstick to see how well we're doing. Mm. But the, I think the citizens' voices are so crucial in that because data is always very, very limiting. Mm -hmm. So I think there are people who are innovating, who are thinking radically about what a lot of this inclusive growth or economic justice looks like and means, but it's about you know, people being willing to also um, make the sacrifice necessary to to build those into our systems. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to, to follow up on that. I think we can we can confuse like a complex and difficult situation for an, an impossible one. Right. And we can we can we can look at all this complexity and all this um, debate and and tension, and we can say, oh well, there's nothing we can do let's go away or we can look at it and say look at all these people engaging mm -hmm. with these types of ideas look at these um, organizations try and think tanks trying to do something trying to set out an agenda and look at ways in which it's been critiqued and ways in which we can mm. do it better mm. so I think I, would, I, I am excited that people are putting forward these agendas I'm excited that people do that and I'm equally excited that people say it's not good enough. Right. And that that mm -hmm. is where we get progress. Right. And right. so, yeah. yeah I, I agree. I think it's the, the, <coughs> com the complexity isn't something that we should shy away from because I think we've got, in the last, especially having been coming out of the social enterprise space, you know, we, we, have wanted simple ABC solutions mm -hmm. to complex problems. So we need to dive in head first and say it is yeah. complex. And that's okay because uh, you know we are complex and mm -hmm. we have everything we need and and as long as we've got the right people in the room we will figure out our future. Um, but I think uh, I agree with with what Farah is saying. Uh, Impact Hub is is one example, but there are a lot of really smart, bright, incredible um, people who are working on what we've termed currently as the fringes, who are you know really doing some interesting things. These, these aren't really the fringes. They are absolutely what we should be taking some more risk with. Mm. Risk with. And I think when you mentioned, you know, what's the scene in Birmingham? Well, the, the scene in, in Birmingham is really, we have a massive public sector that has quite a, a, a patriarchal approach to how things will happen in the city and how things will change, and that's left a legacy. And so in a place like Birmingham, I would argue that the, the things that you need to do are start to be a little bit more um, braver with just taking some risks, and they're not really risky, right? Like a community land trust, giving some, giving some ownership to citizens, these aren't massively risky things, they're just <coughs> allowing experimentation right. and that those edges to really grow and, and be bolder. Um, so I think that it's, it's, it's that way we can go from both angles a bit sorry for Charlotte because she was like, <laughs> but, you know, but you know, when we can do those things, yeah. when when the, when citizens and the, the grassroots or mm. cities can can make and thrive, you can come to the, the bigger conversations with much and much. At the moment, it just feels like it's in conversation and the risk on on mm. the ground is not not being taken in the same way. And one really clear example that we should take, I think, um, is from the the GLA in London have been doing lots of retrofitting of investment into boroughs across um, London because there wasn't affordable workspace because all of the growth has has created lots of inequality in the boroughs other cities around the, the country can learn from what happens when you grow in that way and can be progressively planning for this sort of stuff and currently I'm not seeing that level of innovation in in local planning in in our um, you know, in our city particularly, mm. and that's the, the spaces where I think you can deal with the big, and you could also start to create the conditions for people to be able to create their spaces and places too. Mm. I mean, I think also it's interesting, you know, that in, in complex systems, it sort of doesn't matter where you start, does it? You know, we tend to think, oh, it has to be planned and linear, but complex systems by their nature are not. 
And actually, the way you learn about them exactly, as you say, is you, ex you experiment. And that's how you learn how the system behaves. Charlotte, did you want to say something? Yeah, I would just say, um, I think we need to hold on, we need to hold ourselves and particularly our city leaders to task so that that um, whilst they want to, whilst, whilst you need to start somewhere, there is one thing that you must not do. And that's first turn to relabeling your existing activity and call it inclusive growth or call it integration or call it whatever. And we're seeing that time and again, <coughs> and I think that's the most dispiriting thing for me, mm. um, having tried to inspire it and um, uh, encourage people into into thinking in a new way. Actually, for that to be yeah. kind of there to be this bandwagon where you can just jump on it and ro roll, you know, roughshod over um, the kind of radicalism and vision that actually could really come from it. Great, thank you. Questions, comments from the floor. Does this feel like Bristol? Does it feel relevant to what's happening here? Yeah. Hello, I'm Carrie Poole. I'm on the bus route of Bristol. Also involved in the Mayor's City Office um, as a voluntary resident. Um, and I think you're absolutely right to put that out. It has the potential to be a whole new way of doing things but there are some quite big hurdles, really. And two of the hurdles, um, what it's trying to do is bring together all players across the city to work out what it is we want Bristol to be and how can we really harness the resources of all agencies and communities and people's talents to get there. Um, and in fact, there's a shaping the future of Bristol event happening just after this. Um, but the two challenges it faces, really, are and how do we make sure we don't just engage the people who, who have always been engaged, yeah. the institutions, the agencies? And I think there is a willingness um, within the leadership of the city um, for some kind of power giving um, so that those diverse voices do actually come from a position of power within mm -hmm. that discussion, which I think is exactly what you were know, saying really needs to happen. Um, but I think we really need to be absolutely really focused on always challenging where is the power and you know, whose voice is the powerful voice and making sure that the fringe and the mainstream come to a powerful position. Um, somebody in Bristol once said that the success of the city will depend on how we make sure that the fringe element of and the underground movements within Bristol um, carry on being active and innovative and challenging and constructive critical friends to the city. Mm. Now I thought that point that you made about you know the fringe and the centre and this very dynamic relationship yeah. between the two sounds really healthy, doesn't it? You know, that as the fringe maybe moves towards the centre, the fringe also then <coughs> reconfigures and redefines itself, doesn't it? And that's the city being alive. Yes. Um, I th what what I've been hearing across a lot of these comments, <coughs> including yours, is a, is um, an element of perception of risk mm -hmm. and a willingness to take a risk. There there would be a risk in engaging a new community. What if they hate us? What if that goes mm -hmm. absolutely against everything that we have worked hard for? There's a risk with a transfer of power, mm. but I'm accountable, so I can't do that. I've always been told. There's a risk of being um, seen as different <coughs> when you've always been in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I know that really personally from being an engineer who starts who's starting to talk about gender and sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. You know, this that uh, approaching an engineering workforce with those that language and those words uh, words and talking about feminism puts me makes yeah. me different and it's a risk. Moves you from the centre to the yeah. fringe, doesn't it? Right, so, so yeah. the ones who are, have always been in a position of privilege, it is like, it takes a risk of p potentially a perceive, just a perception of risk, but there is a risk and how do we get more comfortable with that? <coughs> I would argue we get more comfortable with that by arming ourselves with knowledge and by, re mm -hmm. and by really being in tune with our values and what we believe to be right. 
And also being willing to, to screw it up occasionally, but not give and up. And listen. Mm. And listen, yeah. Because as, yeah. as more fringe or radical or whatever you want to call it, ideas become to fruition, those same mm -hmm. people then have to be aware that we, you know, there will be other people challenging right. that. And so it's kind of getting away from this idea that we are going to get to a point where we've yes. solved it all yeah. and that we can actually thrive in the complexity and the messy nature of building society, a changing society, that we won't know what's happening from week to week, year to year. And, and there's something about the way in which we prepare to live in that way, yeah. rather than keep harping back to an era where everything was okay or a time where everything's going to be a certain okay again right. um, so I think there's something about the way that we are able to be less fixed about this and, and if we go into this this goes into how we're taught and all that sort of yeah. stuff but these things are it's a system of things that we need to be thinking about in order to really future-proof us mm -hmm. uh, I know you wanted to say something yeah. about call on the gentleman just on the um, <coughs> you mentioned the point about how do we not just engage with people who we've always engaged and I think um, I think for the whole country, but also particularly for us as Londoners, one of the things that we're really kind of still in shock about is around the Grenfell Tower and all the people, all the death and destruction that took place there. And that is such a um, kind of important <coughs> thing to really think carefully about because that's a very wealthy borough in which people who have power um, can get the council to do what they want it to do. So whether it's complaining about mm -hmm. Ferraris driving loudly or people digging swimming pools, mm -hmm. the, those are actions that the council addressed because the residents who raised those concerns um, had power. People who lived in Grenfell knew what the issues were, were saying what the issues were, and chatting about it and trying to approach the council and were ignored. So it's, you know, I, there is all this complexity, mm -hmm. but the cost is so high if we don't radically change things. And Grenfell is just, you know, one example, yeah. but you know, there's, it's not kind of just, be, it's not, it, the the need is not just because Ill people should feel better, but you know, there, there's <laughs> significant cost if we, if we don't radically address voice and representation. Can I pick up on that, just one sentence, mm -hmm. is that that is a social, political, economic failure, but it's also an engineering failure. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a, uh, engineer who designed that cladding and allowed that to go on, engineering standards allowed that. And so when we think of any job in the city and we assume that it is not social or political, we're, we're wrong. Sarah. I think this is where? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. It, it sounds weird these modern microphones. Um, Ted Fowler, I, I, I'm a resident of, in Bristol and I've been involved in various initiatives. I also, like Harry, uh, volunteer time with the city office. I, I, I wanted to kind of draw a little bit kind of a broader reality into what happens in these conversations. We tend to think of power and associate it with politics and politicians and elected politicians. I know that nobody really thinks that, but we tend to gravitate towards that, com that, that kind of um, that register or whatever the term is, I don't know. Um, and we've got to recognise that in Bristol, like most other places, uh, the city council and the mayor doesn't actually have that much kind of leverage, power, direct revenue, kind of spend power to change things. The accountabilities of local government are massive, but the, and the expectations um, are very historical. You know, we used to, the local authorities, I, agree, I used to work for them, but I've also been outside and all that. You know, used to build huge estates and, and, and docks and all sorts of things like that. That doesn't happen anymore. Nowadays, most of the Bristol City Council's budget, it's something like 80%, maybe more, is completely tied up with care, right? And it's not good enough at that care. I mean, not the council offices or all the care staff aren't good enough, but it doesn't meet that need, let alone, which is the urgent needs, right? Right now, every day, morning, breakfast, evening. Um, so, so let's be perfectly frank, there's not much freedom to spend or to change things. And power doesn't actually exist in that way. However, the mayor and the councillors and the officers do have tremendous skills and contacts and influence and all sorts of other things. And I think we, we just need to recognise that, that the power and the, the power the, the powers that, that make a city work and can make a city more integrated, inclusive, lie more outside. In fact, as far as I can see in Bristol, and I'm sure this is the cases I heard from Birmingham and elsewhere, most of the power in terms of change stuff comes from development and other kinds of inward investment. I used to work on inward investment used to attract massive companies to come to Bristol. Those companies, they're great, they're a good thing, they provide lots of good stuff in Bristol. However, the, those, those stakeholders 
um, our investors that may go somewhere else at some other time. They're not necessarily with us forever. It's great to have their investment, it's great to have those people coming here and boosting our economy and, and helping improve our services. But the long-term stakeholders are probably the least mobile in terms of city region. And yet those are the stakeholders that we don't actually ask to make an investment. These days, council tax and, and in the and, and main tax is, is kind of raised very <coughs> high. You know, the, the pressure where you pay is much higher than when I was young. And the amount that we pay is much less than when I was young. So when I started work on a very low basic wage, um, I paid 35% of my wages on tax and A9, right? And I was earning less than a quid an hour. So, you know, let's, let's, be, let's be real. Of course, that was in the 70s, but that's, that's, that's the kind of the range of state that we expect in the social contract from poor people. Nothing. So they become dependent. So they're not really valuable. So let's carry on and do something, see if something good happens to the poor people, um, those that aren't, um, you know, that, that are deserving poor. That's what we're beginning to talk about these days, isn't it? The deserving poor. Um, uh, when it comes to investment, the, the, the mutual institutions and those institutions that help build houses and, and um, the, the, the kind of the, the cooperative and other, and other institutions, those institutions, they're declining as well. In terms of investment, we ask everybody except our own citizens to be investors in our stuff. For PFI to go to China and Saudi Arabia, we don't ask our own citizens. Well, one of the things, the disruptive things we are trying to do in Bristol is create an institution called Bristol and Bath Regional Capital, and the council's part of it, along with the universities and Bosco, the Third Sector Agency, King's Agency, Credit Union are part of it, and, and loads of other people, um, to, to enable us to call on our own economy to be stakeholders. That way, when we have our own assets, we may be able to participate in capitalising those assets and make them last for the long term. I just think we just need to think a little bit more about how we can, you know, make make something of our people as 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 investors, as stakeholders, as real change agents, instead of the beneficiaries. Most of the stuff we talk about, even when we try, we cry trickle down. We're still expecting people to talk about people as beneficiaries rather than contributors. So let's change that dialogue. There's various different ways we can do that, as Charlotte was saying, and others implied. There's an institutional challenge there. The institutional challenge for the city office, and it's going to last longer than Marvin, Mayor Marvin, is that that conversation <coughs> that we're trying to get going becomes embedded in the way we do things. It becomes broader and deeper, and it brings forward leadership and influences, and brings in investors, so it's not just a lobby, so that people are actually engaged in making change, because we have got the capacity here, and I'm sure there's a capacity in every other city. We're not, you know, we like to think we're edgy, but so do every other city. So, come on. Um, let, let's be frank and use our people and relate to our people and respect our people instead of just thinking we're doing the good out of the margins of our development. So is there a better, a bigger, deeper role for citizens than just consumers and beneficiaries? How do we leverage that? One of the things we haven't talked about today is the, the private sector. And I would argue in, in, in Birmingham it's one of the places where we... Um, have a legacy of, of what the private sector can do in terms of building society um, and it doesn't necessarily mean it was all good, some of it was actually brutal, uh, but a lot of it looked at good local development where uh, a job, your job didn't wasn't just work, it was about so many other things, your community, your housing. Um, we have some huge companies and I would argue that some of the, the spaces we're having uh, most of the interesting conversations about what's possible is with the private sector, especially when they start to move away from CSR as a model mm -hmm. and actually start to look at the risk to their own business models and the risk to their own business model of there being such a deeply unequal society yeah. around them for public uh, transport infrastructure to be so poor and so unsafe. You see the Chamber of Commerce in the city getting involved now because uh, they've just done a report on congestion in the city because people are starting to realise that when you have poor public infrastructure, when you have a deeply unequal society, when you have people that cannot afford childcare, cannot afford to eat, that it affects, it affects every part of your society, all the way from your service staff, right through to progression of, of um, different genders and, and more marginalised people through your business. It affects so many different things. So I'd say the most interesting conversations I've probably been in over the last few years, and a colleague of mine is talking today, actually has been doing some work on it uh, uh, internationally, uh, is around, um, around how uh, 
we can start to look at what the, the, the private sector can do, but not from a CSR point of view. As soon as they start to see the risk to their bottom line and their finance mm-hmm. director is interested in this, that's where you start to see things happening. So, you know, we're having big conversations about investing in childcare, for example, looking at the roles of, of large corporates in uh, ha- housing innovation. Um, and it's a start. It's not massive structural funds or it's certainly not where you guys are at with a with a regional fund yet but I think it's the start of the conversation but we have to move away absolutely from this idea that there's beneficiaries and there's people who are giving that mm-hmm. and towards how we can all invest and and the role of big companies uh, to be able to do that mm-hmm. does it as well. <coughs> does it ever concern you that you know as government has less and less money we turn to business in this sort of hope that well they seem to have plenty of money and of course the business community has its own very distinct agenda mm. and I just and and furthermore it doesn't have democratic accountability so what it will do and how what it will choose to do and how it will do it remains quite unaccountable mm. so does it concern you that as we depend more on private industry we're depending on something that doesn't feel answerable to anybody except, as you say, perhaps foreign shareholders. Um, I think that's where we need to understand the power that we have as well, as that um, although businesses don't have built into them the kind of democratic accountability that we might expect from government, but we don't necessarily get, but we expect um, that actually there is, a, if we wield it mm-hmm. as consumers, mm-hmm. And then the business are dependent on us engaging with them. Mm. And I think there's loads of interesting questions around Uber. Mm. But really, I think in a lot of ways, that was an example of local government <coughs> saying, this is our expectation for what we want in terms of our transport. Right. If you're willing to sign up, then we want you here. But this is the minimum standard right. that and we want. And it's the same for everybody. And it's the same for everybody. Mm-hmm. And that that's actually what we need to... I think what happens a lot is that businesses push... Um, kind of the public sector into the corner because people feel very reliant on them, but we need to also understand that businesses are reliant on us Mm -hmm. engaging with them and how do we wield that as a collectivity. And just also, I think you raise a really important point that we shouldn't at all have a deficit model of communities or people, that actually the people are our biggest resource and we need to recognize that and think of where the blockages are that prevent them from flourishing and that we, it's not it's not about charity but it's about recognizing that our biggest resource as a country is our population and how can we ensure that they have the ability to participate and flourish in, in the best way um, so but really interesting things sounds like are happening in Bristol yeah well um, we've seen increasingly in the last few years that um, urban de- oh, developers uh, have have happily you know, for me see started to see and gain the research on how investing in the urban realm around their mm-hmm. property or, or investment will increase the value of their investment so so they've they've made that link mm-hmm. what we can't rely on is social justice being economically viable mm-hmm. and that is why we have government mm-hmm. that is why government exists if government doesn't have the resource then they they have to again work out where their power is. Their power is on uh, regulation. Right. It's on on and and laws and policies mm-hmm. that they can implement. And um, with that power, you can convene people or convene organisations, uh, convene investment banks, and people and 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 direct the conversation. So while they might not have economic capital as power, mm-hmm. they have responsibility and power in choosing where the focus of conversation mm-hmm. needs to be and where the where progress and change needs to happen. Although I think we've seen in the last few years a rather supine government it, in that respect, if you look at something like the loss of public space mm-hmm. in London, mm-hmm. you know, and the fact that there are whole swathes of London where no, you can't protest. No, right? it's privately owned. Because it's privately owned. Um, yeah, let's take both comments at the back there, please, if we can. Just 
quickly. Mm. The New Economics Foundation is doing some really, really interesting research on public land yep. and its sale. And so I really recommend people mm. go and have a look at that research. I won't go into it now. Right. But. Okay. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Andrew. I'm a student at the university here. Um, and I'm interested in seeing that following uh, what well, all kind of we uh, talked about, which is our definitions of success. When we talk about the future, we talk about it as the kind of very monolithic thing that everyone gravitates towards. And we don't talk about futures in plural because we all have different lives and we're all going in different directions. Um, and while I kind of was going to, originally going to ask about young people, this applies to everyone really, how can we help empower people to kind of go in their own directions um, in whatever community and kind of to be able to fulfill their own ambitions and to be believe, or to believe in their own ambitions and to believe that those are valuable, whether that's in terms of managing perceptions or actually kind of structurally and financially empowering those people to do so. And can we take the other comment, please, and then we'll get some responses. Uh, hi, I'm Mark. I'm looking at Bristol as somewhere to potentially invest in. Um, I'd be interested on the panel's opinion if um, we were going to take a building, blank canvas, 20,000 square feet, <coughs> a very, and that, were, that was a very <coughs> small but positive step in the correct direction, what would that look like? Is it um, affordable housing? Is it affordable workspace? Is it a mix? Is it community space, education? And also, is a, to make it slightly tougher, uh, how would that model work if it was going to be commercially viable as well? Okay, a small question. Okay, so um, multiple futures yeah. and a mind experiment with 20,000 square feet. I'm you happy to go first. Go on. Um, I'll come to that one because that's what I'm doing um, in <laughs> Birmingham. Uh, but I completely agree with this idea of futures. I think um, this is something that we need to be really, really clear on about. The future is going to look completely different to what we see now. And um, with especially if we look at things like the progression of AI and VR and the loss, uh, what we're currently seeing is uh, two things, which is all these jobs that are going to be automated uh, and you know the lack of skills we have for the, the jobs that are going to be in the future. I think one of the most interesting things that I've heard and, and been part of recently is, is about how do we reframe that automation in starting to move away from bad jobs, ro robotic jobs that people have been doing that now can be taken over by technology and that unleashing um, uh, citizens to be able to pursue a whole range of futures um, and I mean, no one's brought it up, and I don't know the opinion in this room about it, but I think something along the lines of UBI, whatever that looks like, the universal, yeah. basic, universal basic income, whatever that looks like in this future when we do see this vast automation um, of jobs that we saw as our staple of the economy will be a key part of that. I actually think that that is some of the most interesting work uh, in terms of, I've been in a lot of Afrofuturism stuff um, over the last few months, um, there's a lot of interesting things that are happening with artists and um, technologists in the intersection of art, science and technology that are really looking at the future in a, in a different way. And I think I'd like to see more of that kind of um, conversation embedded into when we're talking about cities, because I think that's where some really fascinating stuff is, is, is really happening. So on the little plug of that, if you do one thing this month, look up Afrofuturism as a rebellion to the fact that we're still talking about Black History Month, because you'll start to see this whole movement of people imagining incredible futures, and we can stop, not stop talking about, but we can stop um, fetishizing um, black history as one of the, it's just right. about oppression. Um, <laughs> so I, I'd really recommend it. Um, and then on that, yes, there are loads of models. I'm, I'm not going to like talk about it right now. But absolutely, I think this is the, the, the future of public spaces that we need to be thinking about. And we need to think about what community ownership looks like within that. Um, the, a mixture of all those different things are crucial. Um, but uh, I'm really happy to talk about that at some point afterwards. Uh, invest and, and make some of the community in, in co-owners in your investment. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like because we're almost, almost out of time, I'd like to ask each of our panellists um, about something really, really, really immediately practical, which is we all are here because we care about making our cities better, more inclusive, more integrated. We can figure out actually what we mean by that. But what can anyone in this room do tomorrow that might make their city better? Charlotte, do you want to kick off? Well... I didn't catch your second point about the future of the Bristol City Office, but between you and Ted, you sort of hinted at 
you need to make this so that it lasts longer than this mayoral tea. And it starts to really change the nature in which you do policy, politics, and every one of the residents of Bristol wields power in their own m multiple, various, self-defined ways um, for the for the for the good of the city and and, and and I would hope creating some shared sense of what that good wants to look like. So specifically for people in this room, I would say that if the Bristol City Office seems to be a model that is in any way under threat, whether that's through resource or whether that's because it's just really, really hard to do, I would encourage you, each of you to try and get behind it as a volunteer or, or bringing your business to it or bringing or your professional investor. expertise mm -hmm. or as an investor and the fund is another great idea and the, and the city fund is another thing that the mayor's trying to do. And I think it's a really tangible way of you getting involved. I describe, I think as I said before, that model as the future of city governance. And so it's, I think it's beholden on every resident of Bristol to really show that to the other cities in the UK. Yeah, please. Right. <laughs> okay. Can we? Um, in, in a simple, tangible thing, check your own privilege, all of us. Mm. All of us. Check your own power. Every time you're convening anything, check who's in the room, who speaks first, who takes up the most time, who are we listening to, and... Um, as a bare, bare minimum, if you're working on something, go ask someone very different to you their opinion on it. Just to start opening out your mind about the range of perspectives that exist um, in, in our cities. And just do that at every check. Put it at the end of your bed, put it on your window, put it on your mirror, so that you can check throughout your day, am I doing the best I can to make the small thing that I'm doing as inclusive as radical and, and feel uncomfortable and if you don't feel uncomfortable in the projects and work that you're doing you need to get some more people in to challenge you and make you feel comfortable and be and hold that complexity and that un discomfort and, and help it to thrive and help other people to come on a journey where discomfort and uncertainty is something that we learn to thrive in and we learn to build um, f better things. Yeah. Oh, it is just an incredible thing isn't it that Privilege to the privileged is completely invisible. Yeah. Yeah. They just think that it's natural. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I was going to say exactly that, but I'll say something else that you have four different options. Um, I would say, in, in addition to kind of looking at your own privilege, also start participating in holding people to account, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's using data, whether that's using um, and kind of qual people's experiences but expect better from our public sector, from our private sector, from ourselves, from whatever, all our institutions be part of holding them accountable uh, because at the moment there are not processes built into them that hold them accountable. Right. So I have to think of a new one. <laughs> you do, that's an <laughs> occupational hazard of uh, coming last. Okay. Um, <laughs> I reiterate all of those points. Um, I think that in these kinds of situations our power relies or is given by our knowledge and understanding of the issue. And if we don't, you know, if you see something bad happen, you're like, that feels wrong. Mm -hmm. And you don't know why, you don't know what it was about it, you don't, have a, you don't have a starting point to start a discussion about it. So I would urge people to get informed, uh, read about it, read about the issues, talk about the issues, and importantly, interpret it for your life and what it means for you interpret it for what it means for your day job, whether your day job is like being a granddad or being the CEO of the city council. What do these issues mean? And kind of codify it. What do I have to look out for? Interpret, like, make your own user, user manual about how you are going to conduct yourself. Great. Yeah? Right, so I would say I go through life with two big questions in my head, which is how can I help? And how do we make this better? Even if it's great. How do we make it better? Because everything can get better. Right. You want to um, add it? Yeah, sorry, Tor, going again. But um, the George, I went to a talk recently with John, George Bonbiot, and he had used a phrase that I found really useful in thinking about this, because he was also talking about the environment and kind of the limitations on growth. Um, and he said that well, we need to have a model that talks about public luxury and private sufficiency and not just try and have 
that we can't mm. all live in luxury. Um, that's not a model that's sustainable or works, but we need to think about our public space as somewhere we have luxury and in our private space we have sufficiency. And I found that really useful. I just wanted to that's share it. Mm. Great. Wonderful. There are a few more events as part of the uh, Festival of Future Cities between now and the end of the evening. So do please check the box office um, to see what's available and what's going on. There is a bookstore with some wonderful books by some of our panelists, and they will be there if you want to follow up with them. And in the meantime, can I just thank everybody here, everybody in the room, for your contributions, for being here, for being interested, for caring about Bristol. Thank you very much.